Good afternoon. I'm the CEO of a biomed uh, company producing high quality products and services. I now want to reach uh, a different marketing segment. So my marketing department uh, suggested that I need to rebrand my company. I need to create a new identity. So I consulted a branding agency and they said typography has got a great impact on rebranding. And they suggested to speak to Mr. Bruno of Retype Your Type. Ah, Dr. Alessia, how wonderful to meet you. you know, it's a great honor and a great pleasure to be able to pitch you know, for this. Now, we at Retype Your Type obviously feel that typography and, by extension, type design is the absolute foundation and the basics of your brand and expression. We believe you know, that we can make a typeface, with our typeface, we can make your customers sing and dance, and of course we can give you a return on investment. Hey, hey, stop there. How can you prove that? A return on investment? I'm going to spend a lot of money with you, so can you show me some procedure in place of your company? Right. Now here we're getting serious. As designers, we have always been suffering from the fact that we're not being taken serious by the CEOs, that we're not being taken serious by the finance directors. And most of people believe us to be the guys with the color crayons to make things pretty. But actually, what we do, we add value to services and products. And we have to start like thinking in terms of proving that. And the first thing is to actually start up with a process. At Dalton Mark, when designing a typeface, we have actually developed a five-step process. And with every single step of the process, we can, if we want to, and we can, if the client wants to, prove and validate the work we have done up to that process. So that sounds better. Um, ideally, um, you would have a process similar to this one. So you would have a, um, a working idea, say your uh, your hypothesis. Um, so something like uh, whether your new type phase A is better than uh, type phase B or better than type phase C. Then you want to test whether you can prove your hypothesis or you have to reject it. In order to do so, you have to choose some methods. And these methods ha have to be validated, they have to be established. You cannot just make them up on the spot. And uh, once you have tested your new uh, typeface, you had to make something up of your uh, data. So uh, you had to interpret uh, those data, and there you can see whether you have uh, proven that your new top phase A is better than B or uh, type phase C. And uh, that in order to further confirm that, uh, you had to try and see whether your uh, um, type phase, your the results of your um, uh, testing can be reproduced. Only like that you can have sound um, new products. Now. The first step at Dalton Mark when we, do is we, we create a new typeface is to go into a research phase. So you may recall the brief, very fluffy, very kind of like cuddly. And this is usually a standard brief that you get from either your client, the end client, or from the marketing department, or from the branding agency. In the research phase, you have to go in and actually bring all the stakeholders on the table to clearly understand what the aims are of the project. And it starts with the question, why do we do this typeface in the first place? Is there actually any need? Once you have that established, you then want to understand what are the emotional expressions? What is the audience? You know, who are we directing this to? Old people, young people, a female audience, a male audience, or is it a general purpose audience? We also need to understand what is the usage? Is it designed for large sizes? Is it designed for small sizes? Because that affects how we design. Very important is also the technical requirements because today we have so many environments where a typeface has to live in, we need to understand really where exactly it is. The client may have some sort of proprietary environment. 
which really affects how we can design. So we need to understand that. And lastly, but not least, of course, the language requirements. It is different to design for Latin and Chinese than for Latin only because you have different design considerations. So in the res research phase, you are actually developing a checklist by which you can also question the client's understanding of the brief. Not only your understanding, but the clients as well. So you're setting the expectations, you're setting the checklist at which, after, to which you can continuously test your work against. Now, once you have all that in place, you start with a set of what we call ideations. They're sketches. And at this moment in time, we want to provide as broad a set of ideas and sketches as possible. The point is that here, we do not want the client to point at a design or two or three to say, this is what we like, this is what we like, and this is what we like. We want them to actually deselect the designs that do not meet the criteria as we have established in the research phase. So eventually, you may up end up with two or three designs, which you can then take further into the design concept phase. With those these ideations established, you already have a fairly good idea of whether you have met the, cri the emotional criteria of the brief. Now, this is important. Uh, with, with the ideation, we are going to present that to a large group of audience as well, to all the stakeholders. And whilst this is not a methodology, a methodology in the scientific sense, you do have a clear indication of whether you have met the initial aims and ambitions uh, simply by consensus, simply by, con uh, by, by discussion. You know. Now, with the design concept, we expand that into a larger character set. And of course, we also expand that into different font styles. Different font styles allows us to then implement the designs into a specific context to allow the client to make clear decisions as to which typeface should be taken further. And here we're talking about emotions. We want to test for emotions. We want to clearly, or we want to be clear whether the design that eventually will be taken further actually meets the conditions as set out in the initial research. Humans have some universal uh, uh, emotion toward a specific set of shapes. Round shapes, for example, are regarded as soft, as warm, as friendly, as inviting. In this instance, the blackberry is round, it's cuddly, it's soft, it's inviting. You want to stick your hand in there because that's what the round shape tells you to do. But there is also harsh and spiky and cold shapes that tell you that if you stick your hand in there and grab a handful of blackberries, you will get hurt. So spiky shapes, soft shapes. These, these shapes are universally accepted. These shapes have no bearing on the cultural background. So the um, association between uh, type and emotion is now uh, a new story. Actually, uh, Poffenberg and Franken started um, associating uh, different emotion or emotional reactivity uh, to uh, different uh, type from the study, actually that in 25 different type phases. And since then, a lot um, of research uh, in this field has been, uh, has been done. You remember our presentation two years ago in Barcelona? We, th we tried and uh, study uh, loads of uh, um, uh, papers and uh, we came up with only a few with uh, sound methodology. And uh, Bruno would like to go over uh, some of them now. Yeah, the big problem you face when you test for emotions is that you're dealing with subjective uh, commentary. You know, it is not an objective test. When you test for emotions, you're dealing with the person's conditions on that very day. You know, if you have a hangover, you will react completely differently to something as opposed to having had, I'm not supposed to say this now, sex. 
you will be in a happy mood. So therefore, you will react differently. You will react more positively. That is a subjective response to the test. In order to validate the emotional testing, you will have to have a large test group. So the more people you involve in the testing, the more uh, the, the clearer an idea you get whether your assumptions are correct or not, because you are spotting trends. You're not getting clear data, you're getting trends, and that's a big difference. So I just want to go through a couple of the, um, a few of the, uh, the testing methodologies that you could employ and uh, explain a little bit uh, more about it. Now here we have simple A-B testing. You, have, you present the test audience with two or three designs and you simply ask them, which one do you prefer? You can do this by setting the what you want to test into context or not. If you set it into context, you will obviously get a more defined response. Now, A-B testing is great because you're going to get a clear indication of which one is most preferred, which design is most preferred. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that the design is appropriate. It just tells you that the other designs that are rejected are less appropriate to the aims you get a preference. Other than that, you get no feedback whatsoever. You could do part testing, pleasure, arousal, and dominance. So you present your design to the test audience and they simply rate that design against whether it's set into a context or not, is irrelevant. Uh, they, they, they test the or, or rate the design according to those three parameters. This will give you also a set of data that allows you to detect and determine a preference for a specific design, but it will also give you a bit of feedback as to the appropriateness of the design that has been preferred against the original aims and ambitions. Now, lastly, we have adjectives testing. So basically, again, you have your design, whether in context or not, and you set you, you provide the test audience with a set of adjectives. They simply rate two or three of the adjectives to tell you how they feel about the design. Now, this is great because for once you get a preference for the design that eventually will be chosen and you get quite clear feedback. It feels warm, friendly, it feels cold, mechanical. Problem is that you as the tester are already biased by, sec by actually setting the adjectives. You are already preloading the designs with a response, well, uh, with a bi biased response. And the big problem as well is with that, that everyone may have a slightly different interpretation of the actual adjectives. Warm to you means something than it does to me. That's a problem. So, We've gone through the testing phase and at this point we have feedback from the test group, we have feedback from the client uh, and, and we're doing some concept refinements. And now we want to go into functionality testing. Yes, if you are used to uh, Bruno's lectures, at a point Bruno um, goes off on a tangent. So I'm going to go off on a little tangent and show you something. So whenever you move your muscle, say you move your, your arm, your hand, um, the command to your hand comes from the brain, comes from the, oops, top of the brain. Oh, we go there. there. So this command then travels all the way down through uh, different structures, the brain stem, the spinal cord, and then finally reaches the muscle. So this is a vertical command. But this is just too simple, and we are complicated humans. So the motor con control is sampled by other structures in the brain. The cerebellum, which is this little structure here, that helps with uh, uh, coordinating movements, and the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia um, are made of several structures. They all work together uh, to sample the output and to make sure that the right muscles are selected. So all that, all that you see here, um, this is an oversimplification, but this structure is actually very, very complex, but it, it works in a very organized fashion. 
Now, when you come to typography and you want to test your font um, with regards to legibility and readability, so you start doing your research, you end up with thousands of papers. This was supposed to be my nighttime reading on typography, and it actually turned out to be a nightmare because I could not find any um, agreement or uh, consensus on these very two simple uh, parameters, legibility and readability. So I said to Bruno, I nearly want to give up. Yeah. So please help. Th that's the thing. I've been doing typography about 25, 30 years, and every single typographer I have spoken to has given me a different definition of what legibility and readability is. It appears that actually no one seems to know for definite. But let's, let's just kind of like focus a little bit uh, anyway so that we can continue with this presentation. Now, one point assesses legibility as the ability to distinguish letter shapes. One character from the other. Yeah, one character from another quickly and efficiently. And accurately, accurately, and accurately. However, when you see some, when you look through some of the testing documentation, you will find that pap sometimes tests set up a single character at a time and ask the subject, the test subject, to basically say what the shape was. Other tests show entire words, and they ask the test subjects to identify a specific character within a word very quickly. Now, the moment you show a word, you of course has to pr have the problem that there is a typographic context set into that word. And when we start looking at typography in, ter in terms of legibility, we also have to include type size, we have to include spacing, we have to include line spacing, etc. etc. So, so what exactly is legibility? What makes legibility? And how do we test for legibility? If you want to test legibility, say, on the one character at the time definition, you have to set it up in a specific lab condition. You have to establish your methodology. So, for example, you have a screen. It is exactly 30 centimeters away from the person. The person sticks their head on a, on a little rack and they identify characters. Now, that is obviously not normal reading condition. That's lab conditions but you do get a set of results and you, set in, you compare different typefaces with one another as well in order to get all that kind of data which you can eventually interpret. It gets even worse with readability. No one seems to be quite clear what readability is. Uh, in Wikipedia, I think it is, Wikipedia defines readability as either how long a fixation is, so you are aware that we are reading in case and you're having a stop, so a fixation point. So they're, they're re how long a fixation point is, and the shorter the fixation, the better the readability. Another definition is how long does it take to read a passage of text. The shorter the, the time it is to read that passage of text, the better the, le the readability. And then if you go further, you find all sorts of different formulas that actually help you setting up readability testing. You know? And if you uh, investigate those readability tests, you will find that none of them actually are coherent, none of them actually are the same as one another. So you cannot reproduce your tests and your methodology across the various formulas. So it's total incoherence, it's total chaos, we can actually not properly test our typefaces. So um, another thing to uh, keep in mind when you test your new fonts is obviously your audience and you have to keep in mind just a few very basic um, factors, for example the age and well-being of the group as uh, a young 20-year-old um, person would not see as clear as uh, an elderly uh, unwell 70-year-old uh, person. Also and importantly you, uh, you have to keep in mind the uh, reading proficiency from our uh, presentation last year in Sao Paulo, we know that reading is an acquired uh, skill, but not everybody acquired the skill, the skill as proficient in a very proficient way as other people. Hence, how do you test for that? 
exactly. So, and this brings me now to something that uh, in, the, in the whole research has, has become a little bugbear of mine. Uh, there's been this debate going on for a long time now. Uh, do we read better off paper than on screen? And there has been since about 1985 all sorts of studies into that respect. Now, I would suggest that we can pretty much discard anything any research that has been done before 2009 and 8, the advent of the iPhone, simply because the screens weren't good enough. You know, if you look at the pixels up here, it's a totally different image that you're looking at than a printed type. You know, you're comparing pineapples with bananas, not apples with apples. Now, today we have obviously much better screens. And uh, some screens such high resolution that they, that they mimic paper fairly accurately. So from a typeface point of view, you can say, okay, we can do that testing. But the problem is that, of course, if you test off paper, it's a fixed format, whereas the screen is a dynamic format. One day you read it off your mobile phone, the next day off your tablet. One day you read a portrait, the next day uh, you read it horizontal, uh, a landscape, and it changes the dynamics of reading. So let's forget about the debate whether it's something reads better off screen and paper, because it's a futile debate. It absolutely makes no sense whatsoever. Again, it's very controversial in all the readings we've done. Exactly. Some people believe that testing um, uh, a new font in uh, screens is a different story than testing it uh, versus paper, but yeah. uh, we believe it's not the case. Exactly. So, But anyway, the last step is execution. So we are all happy. We know we have fulfilled the emotional brief and the half three minutes. Uh, we have fulfilled the emotional brief. Uh, we have fulfilled the functionality brief. We have tested, uh, validated, interpreted, and reproduced our, our, our tests. And we come to execution. We m that means we're completing the typeface. But we're not quite finished because before delivering the typeface to the client, we have to go through technical testing. It's no good doing all the functionality testing and all that and thinking that, hey, I have actually achieved my, my aims. If the font that you're delivering to Biomed, which has 500,000 users, is, has a bug, and they have to actually fix the bug and reinstall them, which costs them thousands and thousands and thousands. So you need to go through a technical testing. And in the technical testing, again, you need to build methodologies. And ideally, you want to automate the me methodologies, because the more you do by hand, the bigger the possibility that you're introducing errors again. So automation is an important part. Now, this is by no means an exhaustive list of stuff that you ought to go through to assess and verify your technical quality of the fonts. So that brings us... So to conclude um, this lecture, we believe that there is no agreement or consensus on definition, terminology or testing new fonts and clearly this uh, can be addressed uh, in the future. Now, now I think that maybe we as an, as an industry and maybe we as a type Pi have a responsibility to start actually creating proper definitions in typography. What is legibility? What is re readability? What is reading comprehensions? Maybe we also can organize uh, or, or we can set up proper methodologies so that we can test. And all of that will eventually lead to better professional practice, which means to happier clients, which means to us as designers being taken more seriously, not the guys with the color crayons who make things pretty, but actually to the guys who add value to our clients and to our customers. I'll be a happy CEO. Thank you very much. You're very welcome <laughs> indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. OK, so um, we, have, uh, we have a coffee break right now. Uh, please be back uh, by 4.30.